Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So we're moving deeper into this uh, deep time. And perhaps we notice that as the coarsenesses of our immediate cravings are diminished, as the lower self gives up on its usual clamorings for treats of various kinds, that we see things rather more clearly than we used to. Generally, our desires and our passions, the lower ones at any rate, are a kind of veil. They diminish our humanity by interrupting the normal course of our angelic selves with various animal uh, impulses. Uh, we should find that our attention span in Ramadan is improved. We should find that our close attention to things is uh, facilitated and what I want to speak about is the somewhat neglected uh, phenomenon of the shahid. It's a term in traditional Islamic spirituality, ultimately Quranic, which is to say witnessing, seeing things, being attentive, not just passively receiving the information supplied to us by the senses and by the sort of regurgitations of the memory and the ego, but being actively attentive in a state of hudur. And those who are close to their maker find this endlessly delightful. Modern art, it might be said, is the kind of art in the absence of truth of providing us with something that's always new, even though it's always about the meaninglessness of things standing beside the void and experiencing that vertigo. Uh, but the art of the traditional shuhud, the practice of seeing things, for Islam is the opposite of that, because it is seeing things uh, with interest, not because of the paradox of their existence and the meaninglessness of all things, uh, but because of the light that shines through them, which is always new. Mm. They say, لا تكرار في التجلي. No manifestation of Allah comes twice. Everything is new. كل يوم هو في شأن. Everything in the world is the operation of a permutation of his 99 names. And their permutations are almost infinite. They are indefinite. Everything that the true believer sees, he or she sees not just as a mysterious concatenation in space and time, but as a reflection of the perfect uh, interaction of the divine qualities. And so that person becomes shahid, witness. One of the great authors in our, you might say, heritage of Muslim psychology uh, is somebody called Najmuddin Kubra, 13th century. Uh, he was a Shafi'i scholar, an Ash'ari, who went deep into the spiritual sciences of Islam. He was from Central Asia. His uh, hometown, Orgench, is in present-day Turkmenistan. He's buried there because, unlike many scholars and people who had uh, the wherewithal to flee from the Mongols, he didn't flee, but he stayed to defend his city, and he died sword in hand in battle. With, with the Mongols, and he's, he's buried there in Orgench. Before he died, he wrote a number of books, including a Quranic commentary, which he, he was martyred before he finished it, but it's still a remarkable and profound book. But another of his books is called Fawa'ih al-Jamal, which is like the fragrances of beauty, where he talks about beauty as an indicator of truth, Dalil al-Haq. That is to say, one sees not the shadows, but the light that casts the shadows in, in everything. And this particular text was uh, something that, despite the author's untimely end, uh, very widely disseminated. Khwaj uh, Najmuddin Kubra had as his nickname Vali Tarash, which means like the the saint factory, because so many people were transformed by him. Sinners, if they saw him, would, would burst into tears. They couldn't remain in their state. 
And so many people were trained by him to very high degrees. Um, people in the tradition of, say, Sharaf Adin Maniri, who's one of the great Islamizers and healers of Bengal and Bihar. Um, some of Maniri's works have been done into English. Uh, and also one of his uh, pupils, who was Saif Adin Bakharzi. You can see the greatness of that age. The Mongols, the worst catastrophe in human history, everybody massacred. You know, babies including, included, nothing survived. Uh, and 40 years after the martyrdom of Najbuddin Kubra, in the city of Bukhara, Saif Adin Bakharzi meets the Mongol ruler, the grandson of Genghis Khan, Berke Khan, the terror of the world. And something within him, his capacity to see not just the surface of things, but within the firasa of the believer, touched the ruler. And after his encounter, this alchemical transmutation of the lead of the ruler's soul into pure gold, Berke Khan becomes the first significant Mongol to accept Islam and becomes a major champion of Islam. And he's ruling a major empire. This is the Golden Horde. They're not just in Bukhara, but they're in Lithuania and Poland. It's a, an enormous empire. His conversion is a major turning point in world history. Uh, and Berke Khan is horrified by the destruction of the city of Baghdad by Hulegu, his relative, the destruction of everything, the destruction of the books, the burning of the city, the uh, execution of the Khalifa, it's like curtains for the Islamic world. And he decides that he's going to use his, the great Mongol army in order to protect the Ummah. So there begins a war between Hulagu and Berke. And Berke Khan, through uh, his uh, heroism, is the one who protects the three holy cities, Jerusalem, Mecca, Medina, from destruction and massacre by the, the pagan Buddhist Mongols of Hulegu. So a very significant figure in our history. And uh, it's interesting that in that golden age, uh, oppression did not take the form of wild, terroristic, symbolic uselessness, but instead took the form of the cultivation of a sharper perception and the capacity to be welly that would turn the hearts. I mean, Berke Khan's conversion is like nowadays, say, if Netanyahu converts to Islam. <laughs> Some Sufi sheikh goes to the Knesset and Netanyahu looks into his eyes and he can't stop himself saying the shahada. And you can imagine <laughs> the effect that would have on the world. What would they do in, in Washington? But that was the upset that these people with their insight were able to do. Najmuddin Kubra, uh, of this honourable tradition, Rahmatullahi Ali, has this book, Fawa'ih al-Jamal, in which he tries to theorise out this question of shuhud, of witnessing, of seeing. He says the shahid means two main things. It means the one who witnesses, but also the one who is present. Shahid is, in Arabic, somebody who is present at something. Shahid al-Hudaybiyah, a Sahabi who is present at the, the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And that's very important, to be in the moment, to be fully alert to the tajalli, to the manifestation of the divine names as these are combining and recombining in their luminescence in any given moment, to be fascinated by even mediocre-seeming moments because everything is equally what Allah is doing. And to the people of pure-hearted iman, they can see that and they're never bored <laughs> because what Allah does, because it's from him, is never boring. Boredom is a kind of veil, an incapacity to see the unique, extraordinary nature of the moment. So in his idea of shuhud, he has this idea of mizan al-ghaib, which I find particularly interesting and has a lot of subsequent uh, influence. Mizan al-ghaib means the scales of the unseen. That is to say, if you look at something or somebody, when you just see darkness, that is the shuhud judging you, your self is being weighed, 
and found wanting because it's the nafs amara, the lowest self, that is seeing. And if you see light, then your soul is being weighed and you see what is positive. And this comes from the nafs mutma'inna, the soul that is at peace, which is what we should all crave. Who doesn't want a soul that is at peace, particularly in this age of distraction and uproar? And this is the function of Ramadan, really, to give us that kind of alhamdulillah detachment, stepping back from all of those chattering impulses and focusing on the miracle of the moment. So this mizan al-ghayb is a, an interesting and important concept that we are being judged when we look. The Qur'an is constantly inviting us to consider the way the heavens and the earth have been created. It's the scripture, really, of nature. Look at nature, look at life, look at the sun, look at the moon, look at the, you know, the, the miracles around you and be drawn through the surface of those things into the source of those things. But in our time, this can seem difficult. You're walking through Terminal 5 in a hurry. There's an announcement. There's the usual outlets. It's the opposite of hudur and shuhud and attentiveness. Everybody is being made money from through keeping them kind of distracted. Everything is there to make them comatose so that money can be extracted from them. How does one deal with that situation, which is really the condition of the modern world? This message, this stupid move, music, this advertising, this entertainment, it's all there to take us from the miracle of the moment. By seeing whatever there is, where even in our low state, we can still detect something of the light. The great thing about the sheikhs who converted the Mongols uh, was that they looked at them and they didn't just see darkness, but they saw light. They saw what they were called to be. They saw maybe their physical outward beauty. They saw something that you know, the soul can be nourished by. So this mizan al ghayb this balance of the unseen, which judges us, is something we need to call to mind. When we see somebody else, hmm, is it the lower self that is operational? In other words, do we immediately notice the fault in that person? Hmm? Do we see, uh, oh, that baby is badly behaved. Oh, that woman is not properly dressed. Oh, this thing is not correct. That comes from the lower self, almost always, because the lower self wants to find fault because it feels superior. Or do we, at the first glance, the first witnessing, see the best thing? That person is really looking after her child. This person is actually being serious and reading a book. That child is very beautiful. That's what the ruh craves because the food of the ruh is beauty. So this is helpful. We can go through the most distracted modern spaces and it can become a kind of spiritual experience, a retreat for us. Khalvat dar anjuman, they say in the Khorasani tradition, solitude in the crowd. <coughs> so, this skill, which turns, and again, he has this wonderful idea of the soul having different colors, and we don't have time to talk about this now. It's a particular symbolism that he uses to capture the very, very difficult, numinous states of the soul. Uh, the lowest self is, is black because it's an absence of truth, just a veil. And the highest self, he says, is the, the green, the color green, which is life itself, which is paradise, which is prophetic. And the nafs lawama, the soul that blames, which is kind of the conscience, often the guilty conscience, that knows that it should have done something, that knows that it should do something, the kind of humanly, conscientiously alert human being that may not be green, uh, but is uh, nonetheless on the way or aware of what it ought to be. He says that's, that's the red self, because red is the color of combat. It's blood, it's fire, it's tumult. And that's the state of most of humanity. We all have these kind of red lights within ourselves. Not many have turned to green. Not many have turned to green with the kind of verdant uh, peace of the garden growing in their hearts. So much more could be said about the Fawa'ih al-Jamal of Najmadin Kubra. It's one of our great classics. And it comes straight from the heart of his meticulous Sunni heroic 
tradition and has transformed so many souls. And I think that in our age, where so much seems to be going wrong, we need to overcome our instinct to blame and to find fault, which comes from our insecurity and our desire to feel less bad about ourselves, and to train ourselves to see as instinctively and as quickly as we can what is best in a situation, what is best in other people. And that should bring us sa'ada, should bring us happiness, because we don't really get nourished by ugliness, even though the lower self may be attracted to it. The lower self, with uh, remote control, wants those channels generally that have the kind of ugliest stuff in them. The horror film, the inappropriate images, that's, that's the lower self, but it doesn't, doesn't bring happiness. It could be a form of addiction, but it can't bring happiness. So uh, this idea of the mizan al-ghaib is there, and I think in Ramadan it's a particularly good time to try and step back from the lower self, where the shayateen are, are chained, and try to see what's best and most beautiful in every situation, in the masajid, to see the best of people's behavior, to listen to the, the beauty of the Qur'an, to try and make way for people, to try and be patient, to try and overlook people's faults, to try and be beautiful fasters. And uh, inshallah, our souls will move from being black through being red to being green, inshallah, and therefore suited to the eternal transcendent abode. Barakallahu fikum wa al-afu minkum wa taqabbal Allahu siyamakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.